which would have more than a chicken, which would have more than a fish or a turnip. So they started seeing all these sizes uh, of the DNA they were finding, and uh, species of onion has twice as much DNA as we have. And a different species of onion has even more. And a different species has almost 10 times as much DNA as we have. And that's kind of degrading to think that this onion has all this DNA. Why don't we have all this DNA? So Susumu Ono thought of this really cool idea, which has actually become a staple of uh, basic genetics. And he thought, since the fossil record was scattered with all these fossil remains of extinct species, maybe our genomes accumulate all these fossils of extinct genes. And so what he did was come up with the idea of gene duplication and divergence and pseudogenes. So gene duplication and divergence is one way that we get new information into our DNA. So for an analogy, let's say you just graduated from high school and from like some graduation party, you won a free computer. Awesome. You get home, grandma just got you a free computer. It, she bought it a while back, you can't take it back. You don't just want to sell it on Craigslist for 500 bucks. So you decide that you're gonna make one of these machines, you're gonna have it evolve into your gaming machine. So you get a sweet game, get World of Warcraft, get a new monitor, get a new graphics card, gaming mouse, that's your gaming machine. Your other computer, you say, is going to be for school and research only. It's going to be your professional computer. So you keep all your data there. You get an external hard drive, nice professional case carried in, maybe some uh, presentation materials. So that's kind of what happens with your genome when you get a duplication and divergence. And this is what has happened with the evolution of the immune system. And so you have a particular kind of antibody um, called IgM. Really cool shape, it's the first one that's made, neat, it performs whatever function you can possibly think of. But we don't just have this one kind of antibody. You have a ton of different kinds of antibodies that have been the result of all these gene duplications. And so you've got six, seven different antibodies that have been able to evolve in their own particular way. You have one that's functional, and one that gets to kind of explore sequence space to see if it can do something different. And that's precisely what happens. Um, so IgA, for instance, is really good for mothers who um, are breastfeeding their infants. That's why it's really good to breastfeed because infants don't have a really good adaptive immune response yet, so they get antibodies from mom. Um, the IgGs are really good at attacking bacteria or anything that is invading your immune system or invading your body. Whereas IgE, I don't know why this evolved. It's the reason we have allergies. I never had allergies, so I moved to Oklahoma. I'm not a fan of IgE. So where do we get these pseudogenes and junk DNA, what Susumu was talking about? Yay, two new computers. Ooh, you drop one and smash the screen. It is now what you might call a pseudo computer. Um, you can take some parts from it, you know, maybe <coughs> spill pop on your keyboard. You can take the key keyboard out of your pseudo and maybe compensate. But it's not functional as a computer anymore. It's a pseudo-computer. So to go back to ERVs, this is what happens to endogenous retroviruses. They turn into junk. That's good. Junk DNA in the form of endogenous retroviruses is great. So let's say in this particular GAG protein, GAG codes for the structural core of a retrovirus. In this one, we've got a frame shift. So we've got a little insertion. The code doesn't make sense anymore. Um, polymerase codes for all the enzymes, retrovirus gene. This one's got a big deletion in it. And the envelope gene codes for the little spikes on the outside that um, the virus is used to get to your cell. This one's got a whole bunch of stop codons in it. So it's not functional anymore. It's junk. It's awesome. You don't want these guys functional. Um, but that's just one of the ways that you accumulate information uh, in, your in your genome. And even like these leftover bits of junk, can still be used for other things. Like you can take the keyboard out of that junk computer and use it for something else. So these little LTRs, those are the promoters for the virus saying, like, hey, hey, come here, just make these genes. They work really, really good. So sometimes your body's like, wait, this, this one works a lot better than the promoter I have. I'm gonna get rid of my old promoter, use this one. So that's how you get new information.
Okay, I guess we've come to the point where uh, question and answer time uh, is available to everyone. So let's just uh, open the floor up. If you have a question, offer it, and we'll uh, get some responses. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, they, they, everybody's talking about the, the DNA and stuff. But they didn't just have, have, have the, the puzzle. They didn't have it express. That's like you have two identical twins. One can develop a horrible cancer at 20, and they all feel that they're 103. You don't have to identify. The environment affects the DNA. That's how you can have a one species a million years ago lose its wings because particularly because the environment didn't call for it. A million years later, the environment's changed. The species, the, the code's still there. I, I, I saw stuff on TV where they, they've taken chicken embryos and made them grow straight scales by, by tagging, you know, making, I, I can't remember the word they use, but making the, uh, the old dinosaur DNA that's still in the, in the sequence, making it express. That's a really cool story. So like that Paxton I was talking about that helps control eye development. Um, if you look at fish in caves that you know have lost their eyes, everybody's seen this. It's a result of expression levels of that Pax. So Pax is still there, it's still functional. There's just a different protein that's been upregulated to inhibit it. So all those bright genes are still there to make eyes. If say one of these fish gets transplanted out of the cave, they might. There's, there's no end goal with evolution, but they might acquire uh, the capability to use their eyes again. Um, additionally, uh, part of my research is what you were talking about with uh, gene expression. It's called epigenetics. It's a really brand new field. I hesitate to kind of talk about it now, but um, one of the ways your genome keeps a dodge of retrovirus is quiet, like the really young ones that can still make virus. Um, it changes how tight the DNA is wound up around these things called histones. You picture like eight beach balls stuck together. Your DNA wraps around it so it can fit into your cells. That's how come you can fit all this length of DNA in this teeny tiny cell. <coughs> and so what happens when you want the gene to be expressed, you make little modifications to these histones, and the DNA kind of relaxes so the machinery can get in and make RNA and protein. And you don't want that to be expressed. You make different modifications that make that DNA snuggle up really tight. And actually we found um, dietary differences um, can affect how these modifications are made and how genes are expressed. So definitely there's another layer to the picture. Yes. All right. That's for uh, Dr. Jackson. Uh, I want to thank you for um, your presentation. It was really great to see your material and reference. That always is helpful when someone wants to research what's been said, you can go back and refer to it. So I very much appreciate you doing that. Um, in your presentation, of course, uh, yours too, but uh, I'm from your point of view, so I, I like to research what you're saying, so I appreciate that up front. Um, my question is, you mentioned early on about with the uh, variations about human evolution, how you discounted, um, I can't pronounce the Latin names of the, the two skulls that you pronounced, but you also mentioned uh, uh, Australia, the Pithecus, as three non-human uh, leading to, well, not leading to human evolution, okay? What would be the purpose of having something like that exist if they're, you know, for one, they die off, you know, uh, species die off, you know, you know uh, continuously. We've had many uh, primates you know, chains that have died off. But we do, and you admitted that with the apes, that with the non-human apes, that you do see common, you know, evolution with those species, but you disconnect that with what you know we call human or you know higher level apes, Homo sapiens um, species. Are you saying, for instance, that those are just um, apes that lost out on the dice roll, or are you saying that humans are involved in this world of evolution but not a part of it? <laughs> 